There we go. Okay, so hi, I am Julian. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Rob Payton lab, and I'm gonna give a bit of a tutorial here on, oops, wait, one second. on uh, molecular fingerprints, um, and then some issues that you may come up with when working with them, um, and then how you can use them to do some clustering um, and use them in statistical models. And so um, basically a fingerprint uh, is going to give us a unique encoding of a molecule. Um, so some some backgrounds of these guys. Um, what we, how we typically see molecular fingerprints is a representation of a molecule as a series of zeros and ones. So it's it's generally um, a one hot encoded embedding of a molecule. And how those how that embedding happens um, is it done in different ways. There are different algorithms and different types of fingerprints. Um, I'm going to be talking about Morgan or circular fingerprints today, which um, encode basically uh, information on which functional groups are present. Um, and so with these type of fingerprints, we um, can take a molecule and then the, this algorithm will look for specific functional groups or uh, certain atoms connected together. Um, and if, if a specific functional group is present or um, some pattern is present, um, that gets encoded in this bit vector as a one. So zero if that uh, that structure is not present, one if that structure is present. Um, we can again encode information on what functional groups are present. Um, we can also uh, get information about molecular shapes in general. Um, something called atom pair fingerprints will give us basically um, how far away each atom is from any other atom in the molecule. Um, we can also encode just general molecular features. People do these sort of one-hot embeddings, but then tack on just um, either DFT or experimental features on, onto these fingerprint bit vectors, um, just giving us extra information uh, about these molecules to use um, in a variety of ways. And so um, these, these molecules, these fingerprints can be used um, to basically look at our diversity of a data set. If you have a large data set and you want to sort of map um, see how similar your structures are to each other or um, through uh, maybe you're introducing new structures, you can see um, how well that fits with your current data set. Um, people use these in pharmaceutical world to do some virtual screening. And so you can either weed out or select for um, specific structures based on their fingerprints, based on what structural uh, entities are present. Um, you can also just use these to do uh, map your chemical space, do a dimensionality reduction on this, these feature vectors. Um, and kind of see the spread of your molecules and how they how they uh, cluster up. Um, you can also use them for property prediction. You can just use these uh, uh, bitwise fingerprints as uh, properties themselves. And so, so you take a collection of fingerprints, um, do some stats, pick, pick your favorite uh, neural net or random forest uh, algorithm and um, do some property predictions. Um, some general limitations. Um, once you have these bitwise vectors, it, it can be difficult or um, sometimes impossible to return them to the original structure because um, you're kind of breaking them down into, into set pieces. Um, and then there's a question of interpretability. Um, this uh, actually can be useful because if you uh, see maybe a, a specific um, fingerprint ve vector that's important in your model, maybe you can see um, why that functional group is having an impact on whatever you're trying to predict, maybe the yield or maybe the selectivity. Um, and so uh, looking into some of the problems that you might see when you are using these fingerprints um, comes, uh, uh, one of the problems is bit clashing. And so you have to pick, um, at least for most fingerprints, the length of your fingerprint. Um, so let's say I want a uh, 1024 bit vector or a 2048 bit vector. Um, sometimes, um, so your, 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 the algorithm will generate uh, your vector that long. Um, sometimes if your vector is not long enough, um, what happens is bit clashing. So multiple substructures get encoded to the same position in your bit vector. And so we can see uh, in this graph, something like this, just alcohol gets, um, uh, encoded as this position in the bit vector, but the same thing for this other substructure. And so what we don't want to see and what we what uh, is can be a problem is if multiple substructures, different substructures get encoded to the same bit. And so um, we'd optimally want to basically 
um, have each bit, each position in that vector be its own unique substructure. That way we can tell differences between them. Um, they might contribute differently to um, whatever your outcome you're trying to predict is. And so um, there are ways we can get around this um, that I'll go through in just a sec. Um, and then the, the last part of, sort of thing before I get into some code is um, you can also uh, cluster up uh, your molecules by, um, by their fingerprints. Um, this is something I actually learned and worked with at my internship with GSK over the summer, but um, basically we generated a bunch of fingerprints for um, hundreds of thousands of molecules. And then we use this method of clustering called Butina clustering, um, which just basically will, um, it's encoded in RB, RD kit, um, but it will cluster our molecules by their Tanamoto similarity. Um, our Tanamoto similarity is just a function that um, basically compares uh, uh, fingerprints for different molecules. And so if you have multiple of the same sort of position or same bit um, in common with another molecule, those molecules will end up being similar. And so um, we can use this information. And so if you have sort of common functional groups between molecules, they'll likely be very similar in their Tanamoto similarity. Um, and we can utilize that to kind of build up these clusters and um, maybe uh, do some sampling from those clusters to um, make these predictions. And so with the rest of my time, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief and to the point, but I'm gonna do a bit of a demo in a Jupyter notebook where we can, sh I'll, I'll show you how to compute fingerprints, um, ways you can avoid bit clashing, and then ways you can cluster your molecules and use them in a statistical model. So I'm going to jump over to this Jupyter notebook. So this is basically, I'm going to be running some Python code. Um, and what I'm going to be using today is uh, heavily relying on, oops. Uh, hey, will you be showing something? It's not, it's not coming. Yeah, up. sorry, not... I just realized that. <laughs> Let me jump, jump that over. Uh, every time I use my screen sharing, it turns off my mirroring. Are you, are you seeing it now? Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna be using RDKit um, to generate fingerprints um, and also do this clustering. And so, um, and then we're also gonna solve this issue about bit clashing. And so I have two molecules um, that I'm gonna start with, um, sort of these longer pharmaceutical-like molecules. Um, and let's generate some fingerprints. So I'm going to be generating a Morgan fingerprint. Uh, I'm going to generate that as a bit vector. I'm going to generate them as a, a bit vector of 4096 bits. Um, and so what those practically look like are still this sort of one, this array of ones and zeros. Um, so I can see if I, if I um, go through this bit vector, I can see which sort of functional groups get encoded as ones, which ones get encoded as zeros. Um, molecules that have the same on index means they have similar, or they should be the same substructure encoded in that fingerprint bit vector. And so if I go through uh, the, the fingerprints for molecule one and molecule two, um, I'm just going to show what, what substructure is on for the 2136 bit and so for molecule one, we can look up the, that substructure. Um, and then it should be the same for molecule two. Um, it is, it's just oriented a little bit differently. But this is good. So this is fine. We, we have the same bit, bit. I'm using the information from these fingerprints for these different molecules. Um, but they are the same substructure, which is good. Um, now I'm going to add in a third molecule. And we can see. Maybe there's some structural similarities, but um, let's see what happens when we uh, generate that fingerprint for this third bit. Um, we can check sort of uh, if there are any bits in common between different fingerprints. And so if I look for um, comparing fingerprint two versus fingerprint three, um, we can just see that they have a number of bits that are in common. And so now I'm gonna look at the um, 1295 bit for molecule two and then for molecule three. And so for this structure, um, for molecule two, my, my, my substructure that is present for fingerprint 1295 is this one. But for molecule three, 
my substructure present is a different substructure. So you can see maybe they're, they're structurally a little bit similar. You can kind of maybe see how the algorithm decided to encode this, but they're not the same, which is our problem. So what happens is this bit is being clashed. Um, this has multiple substructures folded into it. Um, what happens uh, with some of these uh, fingerprint embeddings is um, maybe we don't have enough bits for all of the structural diversity to be represented. Um, and one way we can sort of manage this is just by increasing the number of bits that we have. Um, this is also called sort of unfolding our fingerprint. And so um, how we do this is with a series of uh, sort of, um, we can use this NumPy function, a logical or operator. And basically we can check um, to basically maximize the number of bits that are being used. Um, by increasing the number of fingerprint uh, bits that we're using. And so this, this logical OR is going to check um, basically which, how many bits we have in use across all of our fingerprints. And so um, if I run through this for uh, each of our fingerprints and I use this, this logical OR, I can see that if I sum up that value, um, I get 154. So I'm, I'm using 154 bits. Um, out of the 4096. So 154 of those positions either have a one um, for either molecule one, two, or three um, across all of them. Um, and so what we want to do is um, basically what's happening is for molecule two and molecule three, this bit 1295 is on, but we want to separate those out. And so they're represented in, in separate positions in that bit vector. We don't want to have them at the same, at the same bit. And so um, if we increase this, basically this bit vector, uh, eventually those will separate out. And so what I'm gonna do is now sort of iterate through using different positions in our bit vector. We know at 4096, we have clashes between substructures. And so I'm gonna increase these and see sort of where this, this logical or where this, how many bits are in use gets maximized. So if I run this really quick, I can see that um, I start off with about uh, a little over 140 bits that are in use. We saw that when we had 4096, we had 154 bits in use. And so as I increase that, my, um, the amount of bits that are in use increases until it plateaus. And so we see that um, at 161 bits in use, we kind of reach our maximum. And that means that hopefully we don't see any more bit clashing. Every, every substructure that's being encoded should have its own unique position in our bit vector. And so basically what this is saying is if I want to maximize the number of occupied bits, I should use a bit vector of 8196. So now if I compare which bits are um, in common between molecule two and molecule three, I see less in common, which might be good because um, if I had overlapping different substructures in those, um, that might not be helpful um, for an algorithm to, to then go back and try to suss out differences between those. And so I, I did wanna go back and just show that for the, those original bits that I showed, that 1296 is now uh, 12959 for molecule two, um, and then for molecule three, that same substructure as before is now a different bit. So these are these have different sort of uh, encodings. They're at different bit pos positions in this in this vector. And so this is good. We've unfolded our fingerprint. Uh, our our bits are now represented uniquely. Um, up next, I'm going to talk about this uh, clustering. And so you can use these these raw fingerprint values um, to then cluster our molecules. Um, I showed it a little bit on tandem mode of similarity, and because of time, I won't get too far into this function, but basically we're just comparing uh, fingerprint by fingerprint, bit by bit, um, sort of which structures or which substructures are being re represented and how um, you can get similarity based on those vectors of ones and zeros. Um, just as a quick sort of, uh, uh, to show this really quickly, I can um, compare molecule A to molecule B to molecule C. Um, Molecule C should not have any common substructures between either of these. Um, and basically that's what we see is um, our Tanamoto similarity. So I'm calculating our fingerprint similarity um, for each of these, for molecule A and B, and then molecule A and C. We can see that um, we get a similarity of score of 0.412 for A and B. 
And then for A and C, we see zero. And so this is good. None of the bits are overlapping for A and C. Um, and uh, a few of them are for uh, A and B. And so um, this, these, these Tanamoto scores or these Tanamoto similarities are normalized to a value of one. And so if, if um, I put in the same molecule twice, they should have exactly the same bits uh, in common. And we should see a similarity score of one. I can utilize these similarity scores um, in this Butina clustering. And I'm gonna sort of apply this to a data set um, where my Y value is uh, solubility. Um, and then I'm gonna compute fingerprints for each of these compounds. So I have um, these molecules, I have their smile strings. And I'm gonna go through compute um, our, our uh, uh, fingerprints. I'm gonna do some clustering based on their Tanamoto similarity. Um, and then we're going to sort of do a quick just one off random forest and see what uh, what happens. And so this is just to show you the distribution of our Y values. These are our solubility uh, data. Um, and then uh, real quick, I'm just going to go through and compute uh, our fingerprints from each of those structures. I have, um, I don't remember how many of these I have. I think there's about 4,000 molecules. Oh, there's about 10,000 molecules. And so I've gone through and I've computed their fingerprints. Um, first off, I'm just, just going to compare um, a random splitting of 75 uh, train and 25 tests. Um, I'm just going to uh, use a scikit-learn function to test train split. Um, and then I'm going to, I would run this really quick, but uh, for time's sake, I've ran these beforehand. Um, and I just basically do a random forest regressor. Um, I use my training data from my 75% of my data as train, and then 25% uh, to test. And I'm only using my, my fingerprint data uh, to train with. And so I'm not using any other um, uh, features or functions. Um, and I'm just trying to use these fingerprint values to predict my solubility. Um, if I run this, this cell, um, I get an R squared or a correlation coefficient of 0.68, um, which isn't bad for just, just using these ones and zeros as these bit vectors as our features. Um, but if I now, instead of doing a random split of test and train, if I now do uh, this Butina clustering, um, what I'm gonna show here is a 55% train and a 45% test. Um, these, I can use basically the same uh, fingerprints, but then I'm now gonna go through and compute their, their Tanamoto similarity. So I get how similar each molecule is to the rest of our data set. Um, and then I use that information to um, cluster this, these data. And so I can run these cells. Um, there are some hyperparameters that we can optimize here. Um, there's cutoffs and um, information in our, our uh, uh, random forest regressor that we could optimize further. But, um, just to kind of show an example of how this is done, um, basically what I get is a 55% train, 45% test. If I, I then use these, these clusters, um, basically what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm going to train using only the cluster centroid. So I, I break my data set down into different clusters, and then I take the centroid of each of those clusters, and I use that as my training data. And so basically 55% of my data uh, comes from these cluster centroid points. Um, and so I can break down into train and test. If I do another random forest regressor, um, I get uh, basically an R squared of 0.71. So about the same marginally better than what we're doing randomly splitting, um, but we're using less data to train with, which, which I think is valuable uh, uh, for this. It's, it's a way of clustering, a way of sort of curating your training set so that you um, can kind of get uh, some all right results without using sort of randomly split and split data. So um, that's all I have. We, we're basically using less training sets. Um, it's a way of, it's a method of clustering based on fingerprints. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I'll try to wrap up, but um, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions on generating these fingerprints or using, I can send out this notebook in my slides as well. Thanks.